hello everybody happy new year uh, i'm getting some little bleep saying my connection may be a little uh unstable at the moment we're got, getting some bad weather where i am so uh if i freeze up someone just let me know and i can try and switch the network i'm on now today we are here to talk about summations but before we do that i need to encourage you if you are not already an academy member you should join there's lots of great benefits special things we do for members only and uh if you feel you've been getting a lot of value out of all the cles you've been getting for free join us once you're a member you can get on boards you can change policy and law and really uh, get involved in network so uh, i encourage you to do so now, today is part five. This is, if you could believe it, the last part of this series, the trial skills series, uh, and it is appropriately ending at the last stage of the trial. So um, we are going to talk about summations in, uh, in an hour. And as many of you know, what I like to do is try and get through as much material I can talk about in the first hour. And then from 2 to 2.30, I will... Um, do q a so please feel free to post your q a uh, and i will get to everything uh starting at two o'clock sometimes i'll address if i can uh, look at them when we take our little breaks uh for the codes and commercials and i can come back and talk about it uh, also this is a community that we've been building and so i don't profess to know everything by any means so if a question is up there and anybody wants to throw in their thoughts their comments their answers uh, in the Q&A, please do that. I really enjoy seeing the back and forth. Uh, and I'm always trying to learn as you are. That's why you're here. So I find that that helps. As in all of the CLEs I present, um, you, you'll, you may know a lot of this, you may know none of it. Uh, but if you take, you know, even a good tidbit away from the CLE to help you in your next summation, um, then it'll be worthwhile. Uh, at least that's my approach when I attend CLEs. So the summation is the end of the trial, and it's a very exciting part of the trial. Uh, other than opening statement, it's the only time that you really have the opportunity, uninterrupted, hopefully, we'll talk about that, but really to control the content, control the delivery of what a jury is going to hear at trial. As much as we try to in our direct exams and our cross exams, um, there's witnesses, there's adversaries objecting. It, it, it's, there's a lot of um, unknowns and X factors. But in a summation, like an opening, you have the jury, your audience sitting there. They want to hear from you. They want to hear what you have to say about what transpired in this trial. And you need to deliver. This is your time. It's your time to be creative, to be persuasive to pull all the bits and pieces of the trial that you think support your theory of the case and provide that to the jury in a way that's going to sink in, that's going to get them to think, even about things that they didn't even notice were happening during the trial. You may have gotten something great out of a witness in one of your examinations to help you really make your case, and it lines up perfectly with the judge's charge, and the jury may not even caught it. And that's where you're going to deliver it to them. And you're going to explain the significance of that question and answer session in the case. So I am a plaintiff's lawyer. I've only given summations in a plaintiff's personal injury cases. I've given a lot of them over the last 25 years. Uh, I've never done a defense summation, although I've seen a lot of them. So I'll give some comments perhaps throughout the hour uh, about what I like and don't like that I see uh, in my adversary's summations, um, but I can't really give you a, a roadmap for the proper way to do a defense summation in the way that I can for a plaintiff summation. So everything I say comes through that lens as a plaintiff's lawyer, but certainly for those of you who are uh, on the defense side or on the insurance side, claim side, um, it's really important, I think, to see the behind the scenes of what goes through uh, the preparation for a plaintiff's uh, summation. So that helps you to prepare for a defense. Now, the order of summations will be the uh, defense first, 
usually, and the plaintiff last. It is typically the party that has the burden of proof in a case uh, who goes first in openings and last in summations, and that's the plaintiff's lawyer. Now, the federal rules have some things to say about that, but most federal judges, in my experience, will follow the format of the uh, defendant going first and then plaintiff uh, summing up afterwards. The jury charge happens at the close of summations, if you've been wondering about that. You have a charging conference before uh, summations at the end of all the testimony when both parties have rested. And then, you, and that's where you go over the law, what the jury's gonna be charged. That's the pattern jury instructions. They need to be modified. Uh, and then after the summations are completed, the lawyers sit down and then the judge will charge the jury on the law. And then the jury will then go and deliberate the fate of your case. So as in any other aspect of the trial, preparation, 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 you just saw it on the commercial spot. I mean, that's the key. That is the key uh, to being a good lawyer. And that is most definitely the key to being a good trial attorney uh, is preparation of every element of the case and especially the summation. Now, I suggest, and I think many lawyers who've tried a lot of cases will agree, that preparing for your summation starts oftentimes before the actual trial. Many cases I have, I'm always thinking, how am I gonna address this in opening? I'm picturing how I'm gonna address it in summation. Um, you start thinking about these things when you're, when you're really knee deep into a trial. And if you haven't started before, you certainly need to start it uh, preparing for your summation at the beginning of the trial. It starts with what we spoke about in opening statement all the way through your examinations. Remember I talked about picking the apples for your basket, okay? Those apples are the items that you need through testimony, through evidence to make your case. Uh, legally, you have to make out as a plaintiff a prima facie case. If you're uh, defending a case, you have to establish the elements of your defense. The burden shifts to the defense to prove comparative fault or the plaintiff's negligence. So you want to make sure legally you've done your job and you've gotten all of those tidbits. And you also want to make sure that you've collected your apples, your evidence um, for anything else that's going to be persuasive in helping you to win your case in front of a jury. So what I suggest you do at the start of a trial is always keep a folder with you at trial for each day called trial notes. And when something happens, good or bad, at a trial, you should always be taking little notes. And then you take that piece of paper and you stick it in that folder. And you're going to look at all these trial notes when it comes time for a summation. And the key to being prepared for your summation is organizing it and taking time to properly prepare for it. There's a lot of behind the scenes work that goes into a summation. If you ever see a great summation, you know it's not a lawyer getting up and winging it. It's a lawyer who has really worked hard to prepare it. So you need to take time. And many of you may be thinking, well, that's all good, but what happens when you know I've been trying a case for days in a row, weeks in a row, months in a row, and I'm working late to prepare it for the next day, how do you have the time to prepare properly for a summation? I ask for it and I'm not shy about it. So I suggest that's the first thing you do is when you see uh, you're getting closer to the end of the trial, uh, you speak with the, the judge. Um, if you haven't tried cases, one thing you should know is there's a lot of downtime when the jury's not in that you're having discussions with your adversary and the judge about, all right, what's coming up tomorrow and where are we at with witnesses and who do we have lined up? What's the schedule? Make sure at that time when it's getting towards the end of the trial that you ask the judge, your honor, um, you know, I want to make sure I have time to properly prepare. Uh, do we have a schedule for the charge? When are you thinking of summations? And then as it's getting much closer and you're deciding on when to have the charging conference and all that, ask the judge, say, Your Honor, I really would like to have some time to prepare for summations. Perhaps we can sum up Monday morning uh, so I can have the weekend to prepare. Or perhaps we have Thursday off um, where we do the charge conference Thursday morning so we have Thursday afternoon off. Whatever it is, ask for the time. There's nothing wrong with it. And I've never, ever had a judge give me a hard time about it. Actually, I should correct that. I did have a federal judge once who was really 
difficult and didn't give me time for anything. <laughs> but um, short of that, I find most judges will uh, be accommodating with that. Um, and if they won't, then look, you work with what you have, but you got to ask at least to get it. Now, when you get that time allotted to work on your summation, find a quiet place. Don't sit in an office where it's busy. Don't do it in the middle of your kitchen where your family members are running around. Find a quiet place, wherever that is for you, whether it's in your office, whether it's at home, whether it's a special room in your house that you can tell everyone, I'm locking in here to work on my summation. Uh, nobody mess with me. My father used to do that all the time. We had like a, a room at the house growing up that we called the, uh, the sunroom. Uh, and it had sort of a, a lot of windows around it. It was kind of a three season room. And he would tell us, I'm going to the sunroom to prepare for trial or summation or for court the next day. And we all knew leave him alone. We'd see him in there with his pads and all this stuff laid out. That's what you want. You want sort of a command center to sit there. Bring all your files, sit down, and start mapping out your summation. And I'm going to walk you through my process for how I go about mapping it out. The key is being organized. So you want to have all of your folders. You want to have your trial notes. And what I like to do, and it's a little bit expensive, but if the case is worth it, is I request daily transcripts or specific transcripts of specific witnesses on a case as the case goes on. And what that is, is there's always a court reporter in every trial uh, that the court system provides. And you make sure to make friends with that court reporter. Usually it's the same throughout the trial. Sometimes they'll, they'll switch hit and, and sub out. But they know that lawyers like dailies and they like it because they can charge you four times the amount of what you'd pay for a deposition transcript. But they will email it to you that night. You tell them, I want the daily of this witness. Um, so some lawyers, by course, will get all dailies. At the outset, they tell the court reporter, I want dailies every day. My preference is to specifically request certain things. So in the Amador case that I've spoken of at length, which I'm going to show you the notes that I use to prepare for my summation. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard me say this ad nauseum, that was my last trial that ended in March of 2020. 2020. Uh, so it was the last case that I tried and many people have tried since uh, that time. And, um, and so what I did in that case is I wanted to make sure to get the dailies of the defendants, the operator and owner of the car involved. And I wanted to get the dailies of uh, their defense uh, reconstruction expert. And, and I'll talk about that momentarily because I knew I got really good stuff to use. So when you have a sense you got something good um, that you didn't know you were going to get, and usually it's from adverse witnesses because on direct exam, you, you know it because you've laid it out with your witness. You know what you have and what's been said. But get those dailies and have those ready for when you're going to organize and digest those the same way I talked about digesting in the last part of cross-examination. You're going to sit down and go through the dailies and you're going to find the good stuff that's good for your case. And then you can email those pages off to your exhibit specialist uh, who can make you a nice big blow up of the page that has the testimony and use that in your summation. Summation is all about being persuasive. So it's not only what you say to the jury, but it's about what exhibits you have, which are things that came in at the time of trial. And it's also testimony. You are entitled to blow up and share any testimony that came out at trial in your deposition. And I oftentimes will do that. And I will say, don't take my word for what this witness said. You know, your recollection controls, but look, I printed it out just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Here is exactly what this witness said on the stand when I asked this question. Let's look at it. And I pull up the board and we show it right there. So I find that to be a good technique. All right. So we're getting organized. We have the dailies. We have our trial notes uh, and we sit down to start working on our outline. So this is all part of the behind the scenes process of preparing. And what I'm going to do now is, um, is share with you, um, it starts on page 12 of the materials. If you want to pull it up yourself, if not, don't worry, I'm going to share it with you um, right now. And uh, just let me know, hopefully, that you are able to see this. Uh, Michelle, let me know. You're good. Uh, okay. You're good. 
All right, so what we're looking at now is the summation order that I did. And this is for the Amador case. For those of you who are not familiar with me talking about it, my client was on a motorcycle making a left-hand turn to get onto the Little Neck Parkway. The defendant, uh, Carol, um, was driving uh, the car owned by her husband and uh, she was making a right to get onto Little Neck Parkway on an entrance ramp. They both sort of went at the same time. There was an accident and my client Oscar Amador on the motorcycle got knocked down and got badly injured. And this was a liability only trial. So this uh, summation that I prepared for was liability only. And let me just touch base on that. When a trial is bifurcated, as it often is in New York State, in, in the second department, Brooklyn, uh, Westchester, Long Island, as opposed to New York or the Bronx, where it's unified, uh, you're going to try liability first. So it's a full trial. Your summation is only on liability. Then you will go to the next phase, which is damages. And then the same thing, and you'll have just a damages summation. Or if it's a unified trial uh, where all the issues are go in, the damages and liability, everything's going in the summation. So what I have here, are my notes for a liability uh, trial uh, only, but the idea for preparation is the same, and I'll talk about the distinction in a little bit, is I love using a yellow pad. I've talked about that before. Um, it's a little old school, maybe. I know a lot of attorneys prefer to sit at their laptop and type things up. Again, whatever works for you, whatever works for you. Um, but whatever method you use, it's always good to sort of try and figure out an order. You have to get organized. You can't just willy-nilly jump from A to B because a jury's not going to follow you. They're not going to get it. You want to present it in a way that flows. Sometimes it's chronologically. You go through the witnesses. Sometimes you go through your case. Then you address the other side's case. So, And sometimes it's a mixed bag of the elements. So here was my, these are my notes, okay? These are literally my notes. And I actually changed the order a little bit, you'll see. But the first thing I do is try and get an idea of an order. How do I want to present my summation? So here I said, all right, maybe I'll start with my regular introduction, go over my theme a little bit. And then let me talk about what the defendants just completed talking about because their case goes on right before summations after I've done the plaintiff's case. Because I had a lot of stuff that I wanted to say about the defendant's case. Uh, primarily a lot of what I thought were sort of lies or shady things that came out in the testimony of the driver. And also um, they had a uh, reconstruction expert by the name of Robert Jenna. Some of you may have come across uh, Mr. Jenna in your cases, either for you or against you, but I beat him up really bad um, on my cross. I think I may have included that in the materials last time. So I wanted to really hammer him in my summation so these are my notes about their expert and all the money he's made over half a million dollars just for this defense firm alone. Um, then I want to talk about the difference between that expert and our expert, a guy named Mike DeSico, who actually I was going to argue and did argue, came in with science and with diagrams and made it much more sense of what an expert's supposed to bring to a jury, okay, and how it lines up with what the plaintiff said. OK, then I'm going to want to get to the verdict sheet and I'm going to want to talk about all these things. Now, when I use red, as you see here, the red pen, those are things that are really, I think, important. So I'll either put things in red or I'll underline something in red when I think it's important. Uh, also, exhibits that I want to use, things I want to show to the jury, I will put in red. It's a way to jump out to me as I'm going through this preparation process. And it's also, if I'm gonna look at my notes as a reference at some point during the trial, um, I know where I'm going if I need my safety net, which is what this outline will become. Because when it comes time to deliver a summation, I didn't read one thing of this. I didn't even look at this by the time I was done. I am engaged with the jury. And we'll talk about that in a moment when we talk about presentation after preparation. So here I am. Here's when I start to write out my summation. I have an idea of my order and I put intro and I always put when I'm doing this for my opening and for my summation, intro may please the court. Um, I have always found and if you listen to my part one on opening, um, I think it was part one or part two is you need to have a routine to get your courtroom legs and to feel comfortable so you don't get up there and all of a sudden draw a blank, right, in front of a jury. You never want that to happen. So I always have my routine, whether it's opening or summation. I get up, I make sure I'm buttoned up, 
The judge says, Mr. Smiley, please proceed. I get up. Thank you, Your Honor. And may it please the court, Judge Sampson, counsel, and then I turn. Members of the jury, okay? I hit a motorcycle and I let it sink in. I hit a motorcycle. Those were the words that the defendant, Carol Lynch, spoke to her husband from the scene of the accident. I hit a motorcycle. But those same words, she wouldn't say to you when she took an oath to tell the truth in this courtroom. She wasn't straight with you, members of the jury. And that's how I kick it off, okay? That's how I'll kick off my summation. So you're gonna have your intro, and then you're gonna have whatever really strong point you think you have. And this, I hit a motorcycle, I knew from the moment my partner, Jason, did an awesome job at the deposition. And when he questioned her husband, and said, well, did she call you from the scene? What'd she say? And he says, oh yeah, she said, I hit a motorcyclist, okay? Or I hit a motorcycle. So we had that. And I knew that was gonna be something strong to work with at trial, all right? And I'm gonna say she admitted it, but she didn't admit it to you. She admitted it to her husband, okay? And at trial, her testimony was, well, I don't know. I was, maybe I was cut off. I think it may be a lost control. So I go through all these things and I say, she didn't say, to her husband, I may have hit, he may have lost control. Here's what she said, I hit a motorcycle. And that's because that's what happened, all right? So I actually write these things out. And not only does it help you in organizing the flow, but it's a process that I learned through my, from my father that I think works really well at trial. When you really write stuff out and then you read it and then you cross it out and rewrite it, this process helps everything absorb into your head. And so when you're up there presenting your summation, you kind of get an idea. Oh, yeah, I know where I am on my outline because you've, you've gone through this. It's osmosis. It absorbs right in there. So the writing out process is really important. And that's why I do it for all my openings and all of my summations. So you can take your time and look through this, but you can see where I highlight things and there's a flow to it. So I really hit strong with saying she's not admitting it to you, members of the jury. Jurors are skeptical, okay? And you have to be straight with them as a lawyer at all stages of the trial and uh, witnesses do also. And if a jury feels a witness is not being straight with them or an expert's not being straight with them or a lawyer is not being straight with them, you're gonna lose them, okay? They're gonna write you off and, and you've caused yourself a lot of trouble in the case. So it's important that you've established your credibility as an attorney, that things you say in opening, you've backed up at trial, uh, that the way you've handled yourself is a way that a jury will commend and think you are a good advocate and a straightforward advocate. And that follows all the way through. And it's really important when you get to summation, when you're asking them to find for you, especially when you're going to ask them for money, which we'll talk about in the damages phase, um, your credibility is really important. So here where I had a juror, the defendant, who I had the ability to attack that person's credibility, I use that, that's important, okay? So that's why I come out swinging against this. And I soften the blow. You can see, I say, I'm not saying that she's a bad person. She's probably perfectly nice, okay? What I'm saying is she's just not being straight with you, all right? And I deliver it just like that. When you deliver a summation, you have to deliver it in a way that you're being yourself, okay? You can't deliver a summation the way I do, and I can't deliver a summation the way a lot of other lawyers do. You can only be yourself, but however you communicate, you need to communicate it to the jury in a way that's comfortable for you, in straight terms, the way you would explain it to friends, colleagues, you know, a living room uh, for the holidays, and you're trying to tell people and your family about a trial you, you have coming up or had the way you're explaining it. Talk to them. Don't try to be a professor, okay? Now, I go through all of that, and I talk about her testimony. And then I talk about what didn't make sense in her testimony, okay? And here's where I may have held up uh, stuff from the dailies here, all right? And I talk about things that don't make sense. And then I have plaintiff's 13 here circled, it's important that throughout the trial, you keep your exhibit list of all the exhibits and their numbers and what's in evidence. And you want to organize those in this outline. So, you know, I know my first exhibit here looks to be uh, plaintiff's 13. And I'm talking, and it's a photograph. And I'm talking about what didn't make sense. Okay. Then I pull up plaintiff's six. 
look how far left she is. Look how much room there was to go around him, okay? So you're gonna organize the exhibits that support what you wanna argue to a jury, whether it's a photograph, whether it's a document, whether it's a testimony. You wanna make your argument and you wanna support it with the evidence. That's what summation is. It's taking all of those apples, and these are all apples. Plaintiff six was an apple. Um, her, her testimony were tidbits and apples. Like I said, you wanna organize them in a nice way that makes it understandable and presents your story in a clear way, like the apple pie you're delivering to the jury. So when you get to the courtroom, you're gonna make sure you go through all of these exhibits. You're gonna get them organized before you do your summation. And if you need a few minutes, you can ask the judge, can I have five minutes to organize the courtroom? You'll get it. You line them all up uh, against the rail where the jury is facing you. So you see where they all are. So it becomes an orchestrated smooth process. And we'll talk about that when I get to presentation momentarily. So I'm not gonna to take too much more time to go through all of this. You can do it on your own, but you can see I have go to A. I may have a separate sheet that I wanna insert because this is a process where you're not gonna hit it out of the park the first time you go to write it out, but it's the process that helps you get to what you wanna talk about. And maybe you're gonna reorganize, but you wanna put it down. That's the key. You wanna put down on paper or on computer or on iPad your thoughts and what you wanna talk about. All right, so I go through all of this and I have A that I'm sending it to. And then after I talk about her and beat her up a little bit um, and her testimony, then I go to, it doesn't add up. And they come up with this cockamamie theory. I called it a phantom theory. And I use that throughout my summation, this phantom theory. I like coming up with terms of like that uh, because a, a jury can really grab onto it that somehow the plaintiff was speeding and just lost control of his motorcycle and fell. That's actually what their expert says. And I say, and who do they bring in to support this phantom theory? Robert Jenna. And that's my transition. Robert Jenna tried, they bring him in to support what she's saying, which doesn't make sense, as I've just highlighted. And let's look at Robert Jenna. And then I go through, you see all my numbers on the left. I actually ask him these questions. How many times did you testify? How many cases did you review for this defense firm? What do you charge? And I come up to 500 to 850,000 in my calculations. And I tell the juries, say it's a pretty nice gig if you're Robert Jenna, you're making 50 to $85,000 a year from this firm. You've made over half a million dollars. You really think he's objective? You really think he's objective, members of the jury? Or do you think he's coming in here trying to support some phantom theory? Well, let's look at what science he brought to you. And then I attack him. He didn't have measurements. He didn't do this. He didn't do that. He didn't do a diagram. So my whole next section is attacking him, okay, on all the good stuff I got out. And then I shift gears from him and I contrast to our expert. Look at this science. Look at these measurements. Look at these diagrams. This makes sense. And, it, and it, it just makes sense as to what happened here. And it's exactly what the plaintiff said. And I go through the plaintiff's testimony. Okay. So you have to figure out how you want to organize. And this is the process. You could see all my stars, my underlining. Okay. Jenna didn't even do a reconstruction on a collision. I asked him, did you even consider maybe they collided and try and reconstruct that? No, I just... I went with the theory that there was no collision, okay? No diagram, all right? So then I introduced the diagram my expert did, all right? So I don't want to take up too much more time, but the idea is you could see that the work that goes in behind the scenes. This is what I'm doing. It makes common sense. Always bring the jury back to common sense. Always bring them back because that's what they need to apply. I like to say your God-given common sense, which makes sense to you. And you have to present your case in a common sense manner to a jury to be effective. All right. Then I talk about the plaintiff. Let me get towards the end here. Um, then I talk about the damage to the vehicle that supports it. And ultimately, um, I have to address the issue that there was no negligence on the plaintiff's part because they're going to argue comparative fault, obviously. And then finally, you're going to get to the verdict sheet. Okay, and I'm going to stop sharing now because 
any good summation, the trial attorney in summation is going to go to the verdict sheet. It's something you'll spend a lot of time on making sure that it's a proper verdict sheet for your case. And then you actually go through with the jury. People ask me, are you allowed to? Can you do that? Yes, yes, yes. It will be marked as a court exhibit. You actually will have a copy of it. The court will give it to you before your summation. And you will stand right up in front of the jury and you will go through the exhibit, uh, go through the verdict sheet. You must, must, must do this. Because that's what the jury, when you're all done, is going to have in their deliberation room. And they're all going to sit there and they're going to look at the question. Is it yes? Is it no? What do you think this question means? I don't think that's what that means. All right. So you need to go through the verdict sheet and tell them what answers you want them to put on it. Straight up. Was the defendant negligent? Yes. Check. Yes. For all the reasons we discussed. Okay. And was that approximate cause? Proximate cause means did it cause the injuries? Of course it did. I can have a whole nother lecture on proximate cause, substantial factor. Don't ask me any questions about that. That's a whole nother problem in verdict sheets. But you need to tell the jury how you want them to find on the verdict sheet all the way through. Okay. And not only are you giving them the answers that you believe and so that it registers with them when someone says, oh, Smiley said we should check this. I'm going with him. All right. That's what you want. You hope you have a juror that's in there fighting for you, uh, if not all of them. Then when it gets to damages, you're going to recommend numbers. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and again, comparative fault, you don't want to just run from that and say, oh, I don't want to talk about the plaintiff's negligence as a plaintiff. You want to address comparative fault. You want to say, no, what did he do wrong? And what's great about using a verdict sheet in summation is that it gives you another opportunity to hit the highlights of your argument. So you're not just saying, check, yes, defendant was negligent. But you're going to say, yes, and, and we just discussed why. She acknowledges she hit him. She didn't see this. And you sort of reel off the greatest hits of what was just in your summation. Okay. And then when you want to talk about no negligence, what did he do wrong? He put on his blinker. He looked at where he was going. That didn't cause this accident. So you use the verdict sheet as another opportunity to go through um, your argument to the jury. Okay. Now, after you've gone through um, your organization, you can rewrite it, you organize it, you get your exhibits organized, then you read through it a lot. After you've done it, take a break, get back, read through it. I'll read through it the morning of when I wake up, refresh myself. And by going through this process, you are going to be prepared come time to get up and deliver it, that this is all absorbed in your brain. You're organized, you have your evidence, you have your photos, you have your exhibits, you know when you're going to address it, and it becomes a very nicely, smoothly orchestrated delivery that allows you to present it properly. And now we're going to get to the presentation part. Uh, Michelle, do you want to take a quick break now? If you're joining us today via podcast, the first attendance verification code for today's course is POD122. Again, that's POD as in pod podcast one two two back to you andrew thank you i tried to answer a few of the q and a's uh kay thank you for your nice comments i wasn't able to type in a thank you for some reason on my chat uh and i will get to all of your questions at the two o'clock hour as promised i just checked my notes and i want to before i get to presentation i want to talk about damages because i'm sure that's a, a, a area of concern and it's a tough area this is when you're talking about the value of the case and asking a group of strangers, a jury to award money is one of the toughest things in the practice of law that I've encountered. I still haven't figured out the best way to do it. It's always a work in progress. I'm always speaking to other lawyers and interested in how they do it, um, but it's tricky. It's very tricky. You know, do you suggest a number? Do you not suggest a number? Do you give a range? Um, how do you phrase it? How do you deliver it? Do you ask, always ask for more than what you want? Do you, you know, how do you do it? And what I try and do is, first of all, you have to distinguish between um, hard numbers and soft numbers. Hard numbers are economic numbers that you can actually show to a jury, such as uh, an economic analysis that your economist came in and projected you know, lost earnings, um, future life care plans, 
uh, past medical bills. These are all hard numbers that are very easy. You show them to the jury, okay? And you tell them and you write it right into the verdict sheet what you want. Sometimes you blow it up. Uh, I've seen lawyers use a big white blank board and they'll actually write out a number for the economics and then they'll even write out a number for soft numbers. Soft numbers are pain and suffering numbers. Those are numbers that um, there's no guidelines. The court doesn't tell them. There's no book. You can't say it's a broken arm and I can tell you these injuries are worth between X and Y and here's the proof. You, it's, that's in the jury's domain. And, and it's very tricky of how to handle that. Again, some lawyers write those numbers out on a board uh, to supplement and add up and come up with totals. Uh, jurors will often like to see numbers because it helps them in when it comes time for them to write numbers down. But you have to address it. So generally what I'll do is when I'm switching from my liability argument, let's say it's a summation that addresses damages as well. A nice easy transition is I say, all right, now what were the consequences of this defendant's negligence? Okay, What happened as a result of their negligence or failure to use reasonable care? Well, we heard a lot of testimony about the damages sustained by the plaintiff. And then you'll go through the treatment, okay? You'll go through the pain and suffering testimony. That's where you go through the costs, the economic numbers. And so you talk about the economic numbers and it's always good if you can have them. The, the medical bills, anything else you can put in, uh, income loss, future medical care. Um, always, always ask the treating physicians for any future care that they can testify they think that the plaintiff may need um, and get values. Ask them to testify as to what would the cost be, all right? So after you lay out those hard numbers, those economic numbers for the jury in your presentation, then what you're going to do is you're going to say, but that's the small part. That $1.75 million for future medical care, for wages that the plaintiff isn't going to earn, for paying past medical bills, all those economic numbers, that's the small part of this case. The real damage is how it's going to affect, how it's affected the plaintiff from the date of this accident, the pain, the suffering, the loss of enjoyment of life. And that's where you get into, you heard the testimony. He can't ever ride a motorcycle again. And that was his passion. What's it worth when someone takes your passion away from you? How do you put a number on that? Right. Um, you've heard from the children in this death case about how they don't have their dad uh, and they're never gonna have their father to walk them down the aisle at their wedding or be there for graduation. How do you put a value on that? All right, so here's where you have to get creative. You have to be persuasive. You have to have laid the foundation by making sure that the, your plaintiff and other witnesses give you all of this. These are apples that you need for your summation. And then it comes time to give the jury your recommendation. And there's a, a route that I've been, uh, a sort of a shtick I've been using, if you want to use that or a spiel or phrase that I learned from a prominent trial lawyer when I attended a CLE many, many years ago in summation. And the way that this lawyer who would try a case better than ever I could uh, and could get away with saying stuff. He was older. He had that cool spiel, kind of the Brooklyn accent. Um, again, you can only be yourself. But here's what he suggested and what I've used effectively lately. You say, you say to a jury, you can't unring a bell. You, and uh, you say to a jury that we're all going to move on after your verdict and we're going to live with it. Um, I'll have other cases. Uh, my adversary will move on to other cases his or her honor will have other trials. You'll go back to your life. But for the plaintiff, your verdict will be forever. And you have to think about that because forever is statistically another 60 years. Forever is when the plaintiff is a grandfather, uh, you know, married, hopefully, children. And you have to think about all of this. And it's my obligation as an advocate to make sure that he's properly compensated. And here's where you get into the part that I learned and that I've used. And you say, and I'm worried because if I ask you to award a value for future pain and suffering or past pain and suffering, that um, is not enough. If I don't ask you for enough no money, then I'm doing my client a disservice. I'm not getting my client the compensation that he's due as a result of the negligence. But if I ask for too much money, then you may think I'm overreaching and I don't want you to think that. And I don't want my credibility to take a hit or you to hold that against my client. So all I can do is recommend a number. And it's a number that I think is fair and I deliver it to you the way I've delivered the trial and the evidence to you. If you agree with me, you can agree with me. 
If you think I'm wrong, you could give less, you can give more, that's up to you. But here's what I think. I think that for the loss of a parent, for pain and suffering, whatever it is, whatever that category is, I think an award of a million dollars past pain and suffering is fair and reasonable as compensation for what we've heard the plaintiff has gone through. And for the future, for 60 years, you know, and you've heard he's going to get worse and worse, may have additional surgeries, whatever it may be. Um, arthritis is going to set in, you heard. He's going to have pain. It's going to be, not, he's not going to be as young and strong to manage. He's going to be older and frail, and he's still going to suffer. So for these next 60 years, I think an award of $4 million is fair and reasonable. Okay. So that's how I will often deliver my damages request to a jury. Again, it's not easy to do. People have their own ways and you do whatever works for you. If you want to give it a shot, give it a shot. Um, and, uh, and you have to, but you have to ask for it. You have to recommend the number. I've tried cases in other jurisdictions. I remember trying the one and only case I tried uh, in New Jersey. And right before I was preparing my local counsel, who was telling me where to go to find the courthouse, said, oh, and you're not allowed to ask for a sum of money in summation. I was like, what? I, how do you, I can't ask? How do I do that? So, uh, you know, sometimes it's tricky, but um, you have to do it. And I would suggest asking for a number that you think is sustainable, um, that you think is reasonable, maybe inflated a touch because jurors oftentimes will reduce my father once tried a case in Brooklyn where a jury came back with more money than he asked for, which is pretty cool and a testament to him because you don't see that too often. So great job, Dad. Uh, but I haven't had the benefit of that. But I've had jurors come back with exactly the number. Uh, I remember I had tried a case, not to tell war stories, I won't tell you how much, it wasn't crazy, but um, afterwards, after the verdict, the judge, uh, or after summations, I asked for $750,000 of the jury, I asked for two fifty dollars past painting and five hundred dollars future, and the jury's out and, uh, and deliberating, and the judge calls me and my adversary in, and then he calls me and he goes, why don't you settle the case, I think it's while they're out, it's a good time to settle the case. He's like, I could probably get you X, Y, and Z. He's like, you don't really think a jury's going to come back with 750000 on this, do you? And I was like, probably not, but, you know, let's see what happens. Maybe they will. Maybe they'll get close. Sure enough, the jury came back with it. So it happens sometimes. But again, I think that was a testament to the way that I handle myself at trial, and, it, and that credibility carries its way through to when you ask for money. All right, so now we got nine minutes left, uh, probably less, because I know Michelle's going to jump in. But don't cut me off, Michelle, because presentation. Let's talk about presentation. All right. You get organized, you're ready to rock and roll, and you get on your summation outfit. Uh, I love it when I was a younger lawyer and I'd be pacing in front of a courthouse all dressed up, practicing, talking out loud. And another lawyer would come by me and say, you got your summation suit on, kid. I see it. Go get him. You know, so there's I don't know if people still call it your summation suit or your summation outfit, whatever you're wearing, but dress nicely like you do in openings. Get all the stuff out of your pockets. Don't hold a pen in your hand. Don't hold a pad in your hand. Do not read all of these notes that I just showed you that I made. I delivered this summation and I didn't look at a note. And if I am delivering it, if I prepare it properly, I don't need to look at a note. But if you do, if you're not as comfortable, have your pad have your outline at council table or at a podium off to the side and then what, or the lectern. And then what you can do is in between phases, you can pause, you walk over, you do the water trick that I've talked about, where you take a sip of water, you take a look down at your pad, you flip a couple pages. Okay, here's where I got to go do next. You close it back up or leave it there and you get back up and you engage. All right. That's what these outlines are for. They're a safety net. So you don't totally go blank. Uh, if you need to, you have it there as a crutch, as a net, as a guide. But other than that, you need to come out and engage with the, with the jury. You have to practice it. It is key to delivering a good summation and opening for that matter. So many times a defense lawyer or a plaintiff's lawyer, I will see get up literally with a pad, with a pad in one hand and a pen in another. Hey, members of the jury, you know, here's what we've learned. And they're looking at their pad, they got their pen going, they're checking things off. I despise that. I think you lose a jury, you lose eye contact. Um, that's why when I give my CLE presentations, I try and, and look at you. I'm not with my head down reading, although I have my outlines if I need it. So you need to engage the jury, okay? And you need to stand in the well, which is the area in front of the jury box, 
Um, don't stay behind a lectern or a podium. Almost every judge I know will let you. And if they don't, they don't. If they make you stay at the lectern, move to the side a little bit. Um, if you talk with your hands, that's cool. I talk with my hands. I'm very uh, demonstrative. I like to be demonstrative. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't think it's distracting. But be you. If you don't want to move your hands, then maybe hold them together or in front of you or behind you or at your side. Okay? But be buttoned up, no distractions, and talk to and with the jury. Make eye contact. Not for too long, but you'll scroll the jury, you'll nod, you'll pause. Brief eye contact uh, with each of the jury members at some point is important. Don't get too close to them. Don't invade their space. You don't want to be creepy. You don't want to get right up. You don't want to look at them too hard or too long, but you want to make contact, okay? You want to pause. You want to change your inflection. She wasn't being straight with you, members of the jury. And then maybe just pause for a second. Let the good stuff sink in, okay? Deliver it to the jury. All right, you get up, you do your intro, you speak with the jury, you go through everything, you do it nice and smooth and put up your exhibits. And when you're all done, when all is said and done and you're wrapping it up, finish strong the same way you need to finish your opening strong. And by that, I mean, don't just say, thank you and walk off. Thank God I got that done. Oof. No, you finish by saying something like, I hit a motorcycle. That's what happened here, members of the jury. And I know with your common sense and you apply it to the evidence, I know that you'll do the right thing when it's time to deliberate in the jury room. Whatever it is, you wrap it up. And then you say, on behalf of my client, say your client's name, your client, Nod, uh, myself, I'd like to thank you for the time and attention you've given to this case and the time and attention you will continue to give this case in your deliberations. Thank you so much. You smile, you pause, you stand up strong, and you go and you sit down. All right, that's the way you finish strong in a summation. Now, before I, in the last few minutes go, I've included here, I'm sorry, I couldn't quickly access for the materials because everything's remote now. Uh, one of my summations that was uh, damages as well. Um, but I did come up with a nice summation to share with you. This is the Nell Mellon case. I just want to give you a brief overview. And it doesn't take too long to read it. This was a liability only case I tried 10 years ago in Brooklyn. And my client Nell Mellon was a bartender who was training at Crunch. Her instructor had her do a toe tap exercise where brought out a weightlifting bench and had her tap one toe, bring it down, tap the other toe, bring it down. And when she went to go do it, she caught her toe on it. She fell back and broke her wrists. And this was liability only. They said, it's all her fault. It's a risk, inherent risk, everything you could imagine. And uh, this is my summation at the end of that liability trial. And I, I think there's some parts in there that's worth reading um, because it gives you an idea. I talk in common sense. I say to them, members of the jury, does that make sense to you? Come on, you're from Brooklyn. That doesn't make sense. And it's okay to talk like that. And I say things like, ask yourselves two questions when you go to deliberate. I'm not going to give you the answer because you know the answer. You've heard the evidence. One, you know, and I, you'll see I throw out these two questions that really focus on the essence of the case. And I was successful. I got 100% liability verdict in that case. And I got 100% liability verdict in the um, Amador case as well. So, you know, it's you always need some luck. Because no matter how I prepare, and I don't always win my cases, and I don't always get 100%, but as long as you know you've prepared, and you brought it, and you put your heart into it, in your summation, and you've summarized everything, and you've put in the time, and you've put in the effort, that's all you can do. Then it's in the jury's hands. You may get a great result with one group of jurors that the same exact trial, same exact summation, you get a different result, or you can lose. I've had, I've lost a case or two, and I speak with the jurors after us. Oh, Mr. Smile, you were great, your summation. Oh, you don't even look at notes, and you were very persuasive, but <laughs> we found for the other side. I mean, you know, that doesn't make me feel good. Um, ultimately, you want to win, uh, but all you can do is feel good about the effort you've put in, and as long as you've prepared and delivered, you've done your job, and that's the key, in my opinion, to delivering a successful summation. And I wish you well in doing it. Now, before I go, one last thing, Michelle. Um, if you've missed any of it, you can catch it on the Mentor ESQ website. So I encourage you to do that. The other thing is I've been doing one-on-ones with um, 
people. I've already met with 55 lawyers. I do half an hour Zooms. It doesn't cost anything. I'll mentor you for a trial, I'll workshop stuff. I'll talk about cars. I'll talk about anything you want to talk about. It's been fantastic. So I'm putting the link in the chat. All you got to do is click on it. It'll take you to my calendar. You can pick a slot. I'd love to meet you and chat with you. And I look forward to the Q&A. Thanks, Michelle. Perfect. Nicely done, Andrew. All right. Um, so let's see what I got here to share with you. Someone asked if I have a verdict sheet to share and what that looks like. And, um, and I do. Um, it's not from a case I was involved in. It's just in another case, someone sent a sample of an old verdict sheet. So I'm going to pull that up and um, try and share that with you right now. Okay. So this is what a verdict sheet looks like in general. OK, um, in a civil trial, you need five of six to agree. Federal court, it has to be unanimous. And generally, there will be questions like this and answers. This was a ski case. Did they assume the risk? Yes or no. Um, did they create a risk? Yes or no. Um, was there negligence a substantial factor? You'll see that or you'll see approximate cause. Was the plaintiff negligent? That's comparative fault. If um, if that negligence was a substantial factor. And then um, the total must equal 100 if they have gotten to this point, and then they all sign it. And then when they're done, they enter the pain and suffering amounts. So this is generally what a verdict sheet looks like. Um, they're all different depending on the facts of the case. Um, you know, that's uh, something that you jockey for as an adversary, having some questions phrased certain ways, some included, some not included. Um, some verdicts are done with special interrogatories where there's numerous questions for various causes of action. So um, there, there's a lot, we could probably talk for a while just about verdict sheets, but I do wanna share that with you. Uh, the other thing before some of you sign off, hopefully you'll stay for the Q&A, is that we have a new series starting, Michelle, you didn't mention this. Um, February 4th, but the date will be confirmed beginning of February. I'll be doing a series. I think it's going to be another like six or seven parter. And uh, it's going to be on how to litigate a catastrophic automobile accident. So I'm going to take a lot of the things we've learned so far with the trial skills, with how to litigate a personal injury case, um, and focus on things involving really serious injuries or death cases and, and working it up and the right experts. So please join me for that and be on the lookout for that. All right. Now, let's take a look. I'm going to go through some questions here. And uh, someone is asking, uh, I talked about looking at notes, uh, Tori, so hopefully I answered that for you. Again, notes are important to have. Outlines are important to have, but you do not want to read from them. It's fine to reference them if you need to, but reference them, then look in and, and continue on with your summation to the jury. Don't read in front of a jury. Okay. Uh, there's a question about, uh, is it different in different counties, the five boroughs in Westchester about bifurcation? Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that there's a presumption in the first department, so all counties in the first department, that um, the trial will be unified. You will try liability and damages in one trial, and uh, you will sum up on both, and the verdict sheet will have both. That's first department, New York County, in the Bronx. The second department, uh, there is a presumption that it will be bifurcated. You will try liability first, damages second. That's all the all second department. So Suffolk, Nassau, Staten Island, Westchester, Rockland, Orange County. Um, I'm sure I'm missing something. Queens. Uh, now, uh, any party can apply to request a unified trial in a matter that uh, where it would presumably be bifurcated. And in a case that's presumably unified, you can argue to bifurcate it. We normally see this if we have a case with a really bad injury or a paralyzed client uh, or a client that's lost a limb, the defense will usually move to try and get it bifurcated. Uh, so liability is first before getting into all the, the damages. So their concern is that the, you know, it may um, cloud the jury when they see how devastated the plaintiff may be. Um, so you'll see those motions, but that's generally how it works. The verdict sheet is developed by both lawyers, usually uh, both sets of lawyers, the plaintiff and the defense. Many times the judge, the court, will ask you to submit proposed verdict sheets, uh, same way they ask you to submit proposed uh, jury instructions, uh, requests to charge, those things. Um, and the 
judges do it differently. Sometimes they will look at both and come up with their own. Sometimes they will sit and go through both versions and, uh, and see what we can agree on. Sometimes they will just create it and say, this is the one we're using. If you have any objections, you could make a record. So uh, you'll find out when you get to the courtroom what the judge wants and how they'll do it. Um, all right, uh, so, uh, Kay's asking a question about damages if the patient dies. I'm not quite sure specifically, so if you wanna retype in and make that a little bit more specific, I will address it. Um, Joseph is asking me on damages, have I ever tried to suggest a smaller annual number, which you then multiply it out by life expectancy to get to the larger number without asking about it straight out? Um, there's, there's some case law on that. You're not actually allowed to do that. And I haven't looked at this case law in a while. My understanding is you can't say future life expectancy is uh, 60 years. Uh, I think $20,000 a year is reasonable. Uh, so that will get you to $1.2 million. If I'm doing the numbers right, I'm pretty bad with math. But my understanding is you can't really do that, but you can. And I've even tried where I've come up with a number uh, like uh, 640,000 based on 16 years, you know, that's easily divisible. So it's like a wink, wink, and the jury gets it. And I think, uh, and then when I got that award, my adversary said they were going to appeal on that, that that was basically the same thing as giving them an amount per year. So I would look into that. The better course of action, the safest course of action is a round number separated from the uh, future years. Okay. Um, do I ask for a specific dollar amount or is that just best practice? You know what? I wouldn't call it best practice or not best practice. Again, that is, that's up to you. You know, you have discretion as a trial lawyer on how to handle things. Um, you have discretion. So you can give a range. Some, some lawyers I've spoken with like to give a range. Some lawyers don't even like to suggest a number. Some lawyers like to suggest a couple of numbers or one number. Again, you have to find what's, what works best, what you feel comfortable with delivering. That's why I said this is tricky. There's no um, straight answers, okay? Someone's asking about an anchoring theory that they've heard about lately. I'm not sure about that. I don't use an anchoring theory. There's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, there's a lot of publications on damages. Uh, there's a lot of other lecturers, uh, better trial lawyers than me, saying how they suggest you, you, you sum up in a case. There's a lot of theories and people tell me how they do things in openings or in summations. Um, I don't follow any of that. I just do what I've shared with you um, and I do what works for me. Um, so I'm sorry that I can't address the anchoring theory for you. How do I best quantify the soft numbers? Anthony is asking me. Five million means many things to many different people. Do I prepare the jury in selection? You'll be asking for those figures. It's a great question. So generally, when I'm doing my voir dire and jury selection, which by the way, even in a bifurcated trial, you're allowed to ask the jury about their thoughts on damages. You're allowed to address the injuries your client has because uh, the theory is it'll most likely be the same jury. So you can delve into that. And generally what I say to the jury is, look, there's no doubt I've got to prove my case. And if I don't prove my case, you can send me packing, okay? No problem with that. I'm confident I'm going to prove my case. And if you don't send me packing and you agree that I've proven the plaintiff's case, then I'm going to ask you to award damages, which is a sum of money. Does anybody have a problem with that? Raise your hand. And that's, it starts, this, this can get into jury selection, how you sort of filter that out. But it, it starts with that way. And then I ask people, do you have any ceiling that no matter what I prove, even if the evidence shows that the damages in this case are $10 million, are you going to say, no way, Smiley, no way is any case, any plaintiff ever going to get awarded that? Mrs. Smith, would you have a problem uh, or are you open to listening to the basis for that? And you sort of try and filter them out the best way. You're going to get Playing it, you're going to get jurors saying, ah, there's too much. Everyone's asking for too much money these days. Yeah, you know, I'm not going to award crazy amounts of money. This isn't a lotto, okay? You're going to find out the troublemakers and see if you get them off if you're a plaintiff or keep them if you're on the defense side. Um, so what I will do is I will tell the jury, I'll say, listen, I asked you in jury selection if you would be prepared to compensate. And now we're at that time. I've proven my case to you. You've agreed. You've given me a liability verdict. Or I feel the evidence has clearly made out that we've proven our case. Um, and 
I feel that this number is a fair and reasonable number for what they've gone through and what they're going through. And you have to talk about it. I mean, you have to, can't just throw a number out there. If it's worth $5 million, then you have to tell the jury being hospitalized for four months of your life, having a catheter in you, having a colostomy bag, not being able to go to the bathroom on your own for seven months, um, not being able to engage in sexual contact with your spouse for the rest of your life. I mean, how do you put a number on that? It's not easy, but it's your job. And I'm recommending to you. So that's why you have to, you know, be, you know, bounce it off people, bounce it off your colleagues, bounce it off me, ask people what they think, give them the damages, tell them, here's what my client's been through. What do you think it's worth? You think this is a crazy amount? Jurors may think five million is fair. Some jurors may think you're crazy and some may think that it's worth even more. It's, that's why this is tough stuff. Um, is objecting the best recourse? Um, oh, that just disappeared. Is objecting the best recourse when your adversary sums up after you and they misrepresent something, say something inaccurate or flat out say something which did not come out at trial? I'm glad you brought up the question about objections because you will see in the Nell Mellon summation that I um, gave to you uh, in the materials, um, the defense lawyer objected a few times. And same thing with opening statement. Don't let objections throw you. If you're in the middle of presenting and there's an objection, you just pause, stay right where you are. Don't turn around. Don't look at your adversary. Don't throw your hands up in the air. You just stand there and let the judge make the ruling. And then you move on. Most of the time, a judge, if there is something inaccurate that came out at trial, the judge will say objection overruled. The jury's recollection will control. It's up to a jury to decide what came out at trial. If you really think you have a basis for an objection, something really prejudicial that comes out, then you stand up and say objection and the basis, and then you sit down. You don't want to object a lot. You only want to object if it's really something strong, out of left field, prejudicial, really bad. That's my recommendation. If you're joining us via podcast, the second attendance verification code for today's course is P. O D four six three. Again, that's P O D four six three. Okay. When you go through the verdict sheet, do you blow it up and write the suggested amounts in? Um, I haven't done that. I haven't blown up the verdict sheet. Oftentimes you just practically don't have time because sometimes you're given it the morning of summation, um, even though you have a sample of it. So um, I haven't done that, but you could. You could blow it up. You could write the numbers in, but otherwise you can tell them as you're holding it. I usually like to close to the jury, hold the verdict sheet. I'll flip through the pages. I'll tell them at this number. And then you could step back and write it on a, on a, on a big board. Just have a blank big board that you can write the numbers on. Any impressive tidbits that you want to share from the defense side during your trials? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because I know there's a lot of defense practitioners out there. I think it's really important for you as a defense lawyer in the same way I was saying that as a plaintiff's lawyer, the credibility is important come the end of the trial. I think the, the best thing as a defense lawyer is to, is to keep your credibility. And I see too many defense lawyers um, giving short openings, giving short defense uh, summations, not giving time to really go through the thought process here, not humanizing your client, um, not pulling out the, the flaws. Not saying, look, you know, the plaintiff, I'm not saying the plaintiff's a bad person. And I'm not even saying that, you know, they, uh, you know, they, uh, they shouldn't be compensated. I mean, that's the thing. Sometimes as a defense lawyer, you know, especially if it's a damages only trial, but I think, you know, many times in a unified trial, I'll see a defense lawyer get up and say, and these questions on damages, you don't even need to get to them because as we've said, this is, this case should be defended. Right. So you're you're giving up that opportunity because what if the jury is going to find against you? You should go through the damages. And if you've attacked them, you should attack them. Um, I find credibility is important. I've tried cases. Um, one of my best adversaries uh, at a trial uh, that I won. Uh, I'm happy to say his name, a guy named Lou Giordano, excellent trial lawyer. We tried the uh, subway accident case that ultimately I won. I got a verdict on. But I tell you, that could have gone very easily been a defense verdict. And he gave an excellent summation. He had me convinced and worried. Um, and 
he did it because he was credible. He was a gentleman. He was honest. And the jury, I think, saw that. I think they decided the case because ultimately they felt the arguments we put in were stronger in tipping the balance. But in his summation, when he looked at the damages, he didn't just ignore it. He, he made a good argument. He's like, but if you do get to the damages, he's like, look, if you feel there was negligence, uh, despite all this evidence, you know, we're not disputing that he needs these X dollars for his prosthetic devices and all of that. However, for the pain and suffering numbers, we feel that that's high, um, that that's, you know, that's, that's, that's more than what we think is reasonable. And again, it's up to you. And I think that the way he approached it kept the numbers, frankly, from being bigger than they were. They were still big, but um, they could have been bigger. I asked for more than what they came back with. So I think your credibility is really important. I think you acknowledge, you have to know that you could lose the case, no matter how strong you feel it went in. So if it is a unified trial as a defense lawyer, you have to talk about damages. And if you don't, um, and don't, you know, I've seen defense lawyers be flip about it. I don't know what Mr. Smiley is going to ask for, but he may ask for a number over a million dollars. You know, and I just think that's crazy in a case that frankly is worth over that. And I think that if you, if you say stuff like that, that doesn't help you either. I think the same way I'm willing to live and die by my case and in jury selection, I'm telling a jury, hey, if I don't make the case, send me packing. I think as a defense lawyer, you have to say, if you, don't, if you, if you still think, despite all this evidence, all of this that we think shows that the plaintiff, as sad as a situation it is, as it is, the plaintiff just hasn't met their burden. They just haven't made it. And you promised me in jury selection that even if you hear testimony about it, a catastrophic injury that you understand that if they, they, they may not get there and, uh, and we think they don't get there. Okay. However, if they do, I'd be remiss in not addressing this part of the verdict sheet. And here's my take on it. I think these numbers are high. You heard from our economists who said, and they use the better. So I suggest if you do get to this part that you listen to the, and you use the values that our economists gave. Okay. Don't just dismiss it. I think it's really important. And that's, I don't think in fairness, and I know uh, I've got a lot of colleagues out there uh, on the defense side, and many times you're given a file the night before trial, you're going from trial to trial, you're doing as best as you can, you may not have the same resources as your adversary. That's why most defendants show up with these small little pictures, and I show up with these big blow ups. Um, because you're limited in what you can do, I get that. But I think you still have to you know, come strong with your credibility and you really have to deliver the case the way that I've suggested delivering it uh, to get your credibility and have the best chance at success and a defense verdict. Okay. Um, let's see. Most of my trials are bench trials. To what extent must you modify the way you talk to a judge or arbitrators? They can get irritated when you speak to them like jurors. I get asked that a lot. You know, it's a bench trial, court of claims, some other matter, you know, I always push for giving an opening and giving a summation, even if the judge says, save it, you know, we're not a jury here. I try, you know, any chance you get to be an advocate, be an advocate, use every bit you can and bring it, you know, bring your persuasiveness. And if the judge cuts you off and says, and I've had that happen in a court of claims case, Mr. Smiley, there's no jury here. I get it. Even when I'm beating up an expert on cross-examination, major point, Mr. Smiley, there's no jury move on. You, you move on, you listen to the judge, but some judge may want to sit back and smile and listen to it. I mean, you know, it, it all depends, but go for it. My don't, don't cut yourself off preemptively is my advice. Pitfalls that can lead to objections. Greg is asking about or worse. How do you deal with objections or interruptions? Well, I talked about that generally appropriate objections. And here's a plaintiff's lawyer where I toe up to the line is it's not your place as a lawyer to talk about burdens of proof and what the judge is going to charge. So you can do it a little bit. You can say the judge is going to instruct you on the burden of proof and listen to that because they're going to have to meet that burden. And we don't think they have, as opposed to saying preponderance of the evidence and there's two scales and it's not reasonable doubt. You can't go that far. Um, so you can't get into the jury's charges, but that's why you always want to read the charges and use the words from the charge. We always want to make sure, is it the standard of care or is it the accepted practice? Let's look at the charge in this case, because you want to use those words in your summation. 
Um, you know, the evidence shows that they departed from the standard of care. You're going to want to say that phrase in summation if that's the jury charge language, or if it's departed from good and accepted practice, you're going to want to keep saying that. You're going to want to take language from the jury charge. Uh, this little bonus that I didn't have time to talk about earlier on. Really read your jury charges at this, before you start your trial, and you're going to want to use the language in those charges that are going to apply to your specific case. Use the language throughout the trial with your experts, with your directs, with your crosses, opening, and summation. Uh, at the end, I mentioned summation involving a trainer having toe taps. Charles, yes, that's in the materials. Uh, and that's uh, it's right after my yellow pad outline is my summation on that. So hopefully you enjoy reading that. Um, can I make the verdict sheet available for downloading? You know what I'll do, folks? I will get to Michelle. I'm pretty sure I have the verdict sheet from the Amador case that I've been talking about, and then she can share it with you. I just don't have it at my fingertips. Um, and interesting, what you'll see on the verdict sheet is that um, there was a finding of negligence on Oscar Amador, but not as a proximate cause of the accident. That's why we got 100%. And I believe is the way I handled it in summation, uh, they tried to argue he should have waited before making the left-hand turn. And when I says, look, you know, he made the left-hand turn, but the evidence by their own expert shows that, you know, the car was 250 feet away. So if he did, how, how is that approximate cause of the accident at all? That had nothing to do with the accident. So I think maybe somebody threw that out in the jury room. They said, yeah, he probably should have waited, but that wasn't a cause of the accident. So that's why it's important you address your own client's culpability and how, what your take is on it. Because if I hadn't done that, the verdict could have gone with a, a portioning fault to my client. Um, okay. Uh, Kay's asking, thanks, Kay. She's saying that I'm a, I'm a good public speaker. And do I think it's similar to being a good actor on a stage? I think so. You know, I think um, all good trial attorneys, uh, public speakers have a bit of a theatrical, uh, you know, part of them that comes out. I never acted. I was never on stage. Uh, but I know a lot of lawyers who, who have, um, who are in theater. My father's one. He always loved it. I think that... Um, Part of that is innate, you know, uh, as much as we prepare and try and do something, you have to have a little bit of an innate ability to feel comfortable. And you can practice really hard to get there. Think of it as, uh, you know, an athlete. You know, if you look at the best athletes in their field, a lot of them are just innate, right? They're just, they have a gift. They're fast runners. They're good uh, basketball players. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're good hand-eye coordination. Some of them have that gift. But one common thread you'll find is um, there was a Martin Gladwell book about it. Someone type it in if they remember. I think his theory was you have to do 10,000 hours of anything to really become excellent at it. He talked about how the Beatles play 10,000 hours worth of gigs and how, you know, Andre Agassi hit 10,000 hours of balls in practice. And so I've probably done 10,000 hours of speaking and trying cases and all of that. Maybe that's, that's what's helped. So, yeah, I think it helps. But I can tell you that I've worked a lot with lawyers and also law students at Brooklyn Law School, and I coach their trial teams. And yes, outliers, that's it. Read outliers from Malcolm Gladwell. Thank you, David. Um, I've taken very timid people. Uh, I remember in particular uh, a young woman in, at Brooklyn Law School who was on the trial team, and she really wanted to beat somebody up on cross-examination. And it just wasn't her style. She's very soft-spoken, very genteel. And she's like, I can't do it. I can't get up and get in their face. So we worked with her style. I said, you can be very icy and, you know, you can bring it down a notch. You just need to really frame your questions right. And you'll really grab control. And we worked on it and she did. She was awesome in the trial competitions, which were legit, just like real trials. So um, that's my take on that. Um, all right. Someone said I froze. Hopefully I'm still not frozen. Um, you're good. You're good. <laughs> uh, Gil, uh, I guess, uh, you're, you, uh, you know about the Amador case. Look, if your client's bad, he said our client was awful. Look, if your client's bad, you need to know that, right? You need to, whether you're a defense or plaintiff, you need to prepare your client. And if you have to report to an insurance carrier or you have to report it to your client, 
You know, it's your job as trial counsel to say, listen, I think our client was, is going to be bad. You should probably offer some more money. Or after the clients testified, that was earlier on in the trial, say our client blew it and didn't testify well. You know, don't be so stubborn, insurance adjuster, and settle. Or if you're the plaintiff, you need to say, um, you need to be straight with your client and say, listen, I'm a little worried about your trial. I'm not going to lie. I know you. I know this is all real and I know you're suffering, but there's a lot of stuff that can really not look good for you. And I'm afraid you're not, you're not really doing a great job in our prep of communicating that. <laughs> and if the jury doesn't like you because they may not know you as well as I do, you know, there's nice ways to say it. You know, you may be taking a risk at turning down this offer. So it's our job to size up witnesses and size up how trials go. There's many times, I'm sure we've all who have tried a case, many times that we've all experienced a trial. You go into it one way, and then while it's going on, it's either getting better for you or getting worse for you. And you need to look in the mirror and assess that because it's not from your lack of trying, but it's a lack of, um, it's just a lack of how the witnesses come out. Sometimes bad things happen. You say, oh God, can I resurrect that? Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. So yeah, Paul did a really good job in that case, you know, but you know, it's, there, there are hard cases. Uh, like I said, a lot of lawyers are going back to back, trial to trial to trial. They're not given the resources. They're not given the time to prepare. They're not, they're, their carriers aren't listening to them. Um, I've had many cases where my adversary says, hey, I'd love to get this case settled, but the carriers, you know, they're not offering anything. Um, so what do you want from me? I got to do my job. All right. Um, where are we at? We are at 226. Um, let's see. There's still a few more. So thanks for hanging in there with me. Let's see. Uh, someone's saying, do I subscribe to the dice that an attorney never asks a question that he or she does not know the answer to? Or do I roll the dice or wait until closing to ask an open-ended question? Uh, I agree that you generally do not want to ask a question that you don't know the answer to unless the answer doesn't matter and you're asking it for the effect, for the impact of the question, or for whatever purpose. You may not know the answer, and sometimes you gotta go with the flow. You know, when you're cross-examining and things are going well, and you're walking that witness down the path and they're just saying, yes, that's right, that's right, that's right. Uh, you know, we used to joke, me and uh, my colleagues now who are all pretty good trial attorneys when we were back in our law school days, we used to, what do we call them? That they were um, up on the hill. We had an expression, but it was basically, you can get them to admit shooting JFK, right? They're just like, yes, yes, that's right. And you did this and you did that. And if you've done your cross well, where you know the answers and you've got them nailed, then isn't it true this? And isn't it true that? And isn't it true you shot JFK? You know, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, um, some Sometimes you get lucky, but most of the time you don't want to ask open questions when, when you're on direct, of course, that's when you ask, but cross-examination, tight, tight questions. But, you know, I asked something of uh, this expert, Robert Jenna, that I didn't know the answer to because I had a feeling, you know, one thing that came out during his cross-examine is that he measured a distance and he put, he says, yes, and it was uh, approximately a hundred feet. And I said, well, approximately isn't very scientific, is it, sir? Well, sure it is. It's a measurement. I'm like, well, was it approximately 100 feet or was it actually 100 feet? Because was it 98 feet? Was it 105 feet? What was it? Well, I measured it and I believe it was 100 feet. I'm like, but did you take a picture of the measurement? Do you have a ruler? Do you have a contemporaneous note recording it? You know, and then I might say things like, show us your ruler that you measured it with. Right. And you know, he doesn't have it. Um, show us a photograph of that measurement. I'd like to, the jury to see that. OK, um, so questions like that, you don't know the answer. Could he have pulled out a big ruler and had it? But the idea is you can ask questions if you're not sure if there's an answer. But most of the time you're going with the flow and you have a sense about it. Um, OK, Stuart's asking when the Supreme Court and this will be the last one I'll take. And then I encourage you to um, do one on one with me. Love to meet you. Reach out to me. Email me. Uh, listen to my podcast. I cover a lot of this material in a lot of the episodes, and you can go back and get CLE thanks to the Academy for a lot of those. When the Supreme Court is not offering any pretrial conferences or even trials during the pandemic, how to get the defendant, including the city, to agree to a mediation or even discussing the case when the city is not designated any attorney to try the case one month? Stu, welcome to the club, my friend. We are all suffering uh, that there aren't these pretrial conferences, that cases aren't coming up for trial, uh, that we don't want to, 
even if I had a case coming up for a trial, if I had to put all my witnesses and masks and all that, I don't, I don't think I'd like that. Um, you have to be dogged, folks. As a plaintiff and as a defendant, come on, let's get these cases resolved so we can move on to the next ones that you have. You need to go through your list. You need to be dogged with calling, finding out if it's the city. You know, we've got, there's some great lawyers for the city. They're crazy, overworked. But if you can get through to the lawyer and be a decent human being, which is one of the things I'm trying to get us all to do in this profession, because we've all got uh, our problems we have to deal with in, in lots of cases, but we all want to move them too. So diary every week to call on every case, call up the adjuster, call up the lawyer for the city or the private, say, really love to move this case. What do you need? Do you need more records? Anything I can give you? Can I help you? If you're the defendant, say, I want to move this case, but you haven't given me this. I need this. Look into doing high-low arbitrations. It's a great way to get a case settled and resolved in finality with parameters. Keep pushing mediations. Think outside the box. Um, and, uh, and a lot of carriers are willing to do it. And if you are a carrier or in a defense firm that likes to move cases or your carrier wants you to, send an email, send a letter. We want to move this case. Here's what we need. Are you open to mediation? Are you opening open to a high-low arbitration? We can do this, folks. Don't just put your cases to the side uh, because of the problems we're running into. So with that, I thank the 600 of you that stayed on to listen to me babble for the extra half hour. I think you'll be rewarded with an extra credit. I look forward to seeing you next month. We're going to kick off a new series, pick up some new tidbits. Please reach out to me. If you're listening to this on the podcast, please continue to listen, share it, like it. Thank you for joining me and have a great 2022.